computer. Okay. Oh. Okay, try and admit people. All right. So let's be. So shalom, everybody. We're, it's very exciting to see everybody here. I think everybody knows me, Rabbi Julie Danon, and I know most people here, but I'm also excited to see some people that I haven't even met yet. And I am really thrilled to have Dr. Ron Wolfson with us this evening, all the way from California. Um, I'll say a little bit, uh, I won't take too much time because you can learn about him online, but just a little, I wanted to just share that. That Dr. Wolfson, he's really a luminary of the Jewish, you know, organizational world. He's a professor of education at the American Jewish University. He was a co-founder of Synagogue 3000. He's an author of numerous, numerous books, including one of the older series he wrote, The Art of Jewish Living, I've referred to again and again <laughs> in my um, career. And I got to meet him decades ago, even before I was a rabbi, when I was doing Jewish family education back in back in San Antonio when I came, went out to California. But what I wanted to share is, it's not remarkable that I remember Ron Wolfson. It's remarkable that when I talked to him, he remembered me. I mean, I wasn't even at that point a rabbi, right? I was another Jewish educator who was coming to a seminar and that he remembered me after all these years, I think shows a lot about him and what the kind of mensch that he is. And when he talks about relational Judaism, that he walks the walk. So, you know, he'll be talking today about uh, relational Judaism, which there's a book and there's a handbook. And I, but I will give one plug though for his memoir. That's not what he's going to talk about. So you can't really see it because of my background. And I'm going to show you, hold on. It's called the, uh, I'm going to, I want to show it to you. Yikes. Oh, now I'm in Hawaii. Oh gosh, this is so much pressure. All right. Uh, you, okay. Yeah. The best boy in the United States of America, and for anyone who grew up Jewish in a certain era, this is the most delightful book, so you probably want to read that too. But anyway, I want to, I want to also say to you, Ron, if we call you Ron, <laughs> that you, um, that I'm proud to introduce my community to you, because the, our community is really practicing so much relational Judaism. There are so many groups. There is so much caring for one another. There are groups that are part of the synagogue, and there are groups that are just things people are doing on their own. Everything from Musar to interfaith work to caring, chesed. And, what I, and we've been experiencing exponential growth as people move to this area. What we want to know how to really just do this intentionally and as new people come in, make new groups, make them part of the groups and grow an incredible community, continue to grow an incredible community. So I'm going to let you take it from there. That's. Oh, Rabbi Julie, thank you so much. That's a beautiful introduction. Fantastic. I do remember you quite well. And you all are so lucky to have her as your spiritual leader. She is really one of the stars in the Jewish communal space. Uh, and, and I'm just thrilled that she's landed with your community, which looks like a beautiful place. I, I mean, I wish I could travel there and be with you. Uh, I, I love the seaside. You know, I live in Los Angeles. Um, and it's just great that you're growing so well and doing so well. It's just fabulous. Um, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska believe it or not. Um, anybody know anybody from Nebraska? Can I just see hands? You know, a few people? Oh, good. And, and when I was growing up as a young Jewish kid in Omaha, uh, you know, I had a, a wonderful, warm Jewish family, but my parents didn't think they could do the whole job of teaching me about Judaism. So they sent me to Hebrew school after a full day of public school. Anybody do that? Like I went Monday, Wednesday, four to six. And can I see Anne? How about Tuesday, Thursday, four to six? Anybody? How about Sunday morning, nine to 12, even if you weren't born Jewish? Yeah, right. Okay, good. A lot of us went to Sunday school. Did you have Mr. Friedman? I, I had a guy in Omaha. His name was Mr. Friedman. I've changed his name to protect the innocent, but... Um, he was not really a Hebrew school teacher. He really sold appliances at Sears. 
but every afternoon he would come to our, our conservative synagogue to teach us kids a little, uh, what's called Yiddishkeit, you know, a little bit about being Jewish. And uh, I was a pretty good kid in public school, but at four o'clock in the afternoon, I, at the last place I wanted to be was another classroom. So I was, I was kind of a cut up in, in Hebrew school. Um, uh, does anybody know a little Yiddish? Can I just see hands? A little, and it, just a little. They called me Vildachaya in, in uh, my Hebrew school, which means wild animal. Because I would do anything I could to get Mr. Friedman off the topic. I had the guy for three years in a row, Bet Gimel and Dalit. I learned exactly one Hebrew word in those three word, uh, years. This is the Hebrew word, sheket, sheket. This is all I heard all afternoon, sheket, sheket, sheket. <laughs> I know you're all muted, but I know many of you know what that Hebrew word means. You, you think it means quiet, but not the way Mr. Friedman was saying it. He was saying it like shut up is what he was saying to me. I never heard sheket bavakasha, quiet, shut up, please, never once. And that's all I heard. Check it, check it, check it. This is a true story. All my stories are true. I went to my first bar mitzvah tutor lesson. Uh, and the teacher was also a guy from the old country. And he pinched my cheek and he said to me, Sonny, what's your name in Hebrew? I said, check it. <laughs> I thought my Hebrew name <laughs> was Sheket Ben Avraham for the longest time. Uh, the other thing he would do, he had no classroom management skills. So if I really got him upset, he would yell at me a Yiddish curse, but he knew I didn't know Yiddish. So he translated it into English and it went something like this. He'd get beat red in the face and yell, you Wolfson, go to the back of the room and spit in your own face. Now, do you have any idea what that means? Like I'm, I'm eight years old. So of course I would try it, you know, I'd go, It means, it's a Yiddish expression, a curse, a shpayin punim. Anyway, I survived Hebrew school and got, uh, I quit after my bar mitzvah, like a lot of kids do, and, but I got back involved in Jewish life uh, organizationally in youth group. And then uh, I, I, I went off to college and, and I thought of becoming a rabbi, that didn't work, happen. Uh, my choice. Uh, and then I became a professor of Jewish education, which the people in Omaha could not believe. So it took them 20 years to invite me back to my home synagogue to take, to give a lecture on Jewish education, 20 years. And my mother, God bless her soul, made sure the sanctuary was packed. Like there, it was like Kol Nidre. There are like 500 people. And I do my lecture and it goes well. And at the end, I say, are there any questions? And I see a hand from the first row and I look down from the pulpit and it's Mr. Friedman. I said, oh, Mr. Friedman, it's so nice to see you. Do you have a question? He didn't have a question. He stood up, he faced the entire congregation and said the following, Ronnie Wolfson was the best student I ever had in Hebrew school. This is called revisionist uh, history. In any case, I read Rabbi Julie's fabulous Rosh Hashanah sermon about relational Judaism. Do you all remember it? Can I just see hands if you remember it? Do you remember she started with Hine Matovu Manayim? I think we should sing it together. You're going to be muted, but if you're sitting with somebody, put your arm around the person, and if not, Virtually put your arm around somebody and let's sing this song. Ine matovu manayim shevetachim gam yachad. Ine matovu manayim shevetachim gam yachad. Ine matov. Shevetachim gam yachad, 
Shevetachim gam yachad. You don't know the words? La la la. Ya la 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 la. La 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 la. So, Hinema Tovim we learn from Rabbi Julie, means, hey, look how good and pleasing it is when all of us are dwelling together, yachad, in a sacred community. And that's what you're doing there at Seaside. You are building a sacred community. And I hope, and I sense from what Rabbi Julie has told me about all of you, that you're not building a community based on what I've called in my book, Relational Judaism, transactions, transactional Judaism. What's transactional Judaism? Uh, I join a synagogue, I pay my dues, and what do I get? I get high holiday seats, I get a bar bat mitzvah for my kids, uh, I get a rabbi on call, and then when the transaction doesn't work for me, when, when I feel like I'm not getting enough out of the dues or the transaction, I might either leave the congregation altogether, especially when the youngest kid is off to college, or I move to the periphery, I don't get so involved. That's a transactional Judaism. The other way we used to build our sacred communities in the 20th century, I call programmatic. So what do synagogues do to engage people? A whole calendar of programs. We've got programs for seniors, for young adults. We have programs for young families. We've got uh, this kind of program, that lectures and concerts and all sorts of things. And there's nothing wrong with programs. But I have to tell you the most devastating quote in my book, Relational Judaism, comes from a rabbi who told me this story, true story. A woman who'd been a member of her con his congregation for 20 years uh, resigned, quit. And the rabbi called her up and said, I can't believe that you're quitting the congregation. You, you've come to everything for 20 years. And this woman said to the rabbi, Rabbi, I came to everything and I met nobody. Now, part of that is on her. You know, when you join a community, you have to make an effort to get to know people. But the rabbi was devastated because he understood that if we just depend on transactional relationships and programmatic efforts to engage people, it's not sufficient to build the kind of relational community that I know you're creating at Seaside and that we want to do even deeper than what you're doing. So let me suggest that these relational communities of the 21st century need to be based on three tiers of relationship as you're thinking about your deepening work in this area. The first tier is between the leadership of the congregation, clergy and lay, and your members. You know what the greatest compliment Rabbi Julie can get? It's when Jackie says, Rabbi Julie, she's my rabbi. When Susan says, she's my rabbi. When someone says, you're my rabbi, you're my teacher, you're my president of the synagogue, Joel. There's a relationship that's been created. You've connected the leadership of the congregation, clergy and lay, with your members. So they have feel they have been seen and they have been heard. So that's the first level of kind of tier of relationship. Second is, between the members of the community themselves, peer to peer, family to family, individual to individual. Because all of us are in search 
uh, a place to belong, a place where we know other people in the community who are gonna be there with us and for us in good times and bad. That's the ultimate success of a spiritual community. And those of you who I call regulars, those of you who are deeply engaged in the life of this congregation, know that and have found that. So one of the challenges you have as you grow is to find ways to bring the new people into relationship, not just with your clergy, not just with your leadership, but with each other. So they find each other. You know, I've studied the mega churches. One of my good friends is this famous pastor, Rick Warren, in Southern California. And um, Rick always would ask the question, what's the first thing people wonder when they, a new person, when the new person walks into a congregation for the first time, what's their first question? What's their first question? Now, Larry's gonna say, where's the bathroom? That is not the first question. No, the first question is, is there anybody else here like me? Is there anybody else here in the same stage of life? Is there anybody else here I can be friends with? So whether you're a senior or a young adult or a person with a growing family, that's the first question. So when we get to talking about uh, welcoming, you wanna make sure that front and center in your congregation, especially when you get back in person, are people who are of a variety of age ranges because this is the major goal of a relational engagement campaign is to link people with each other in your community. And the third tier of relationship is between each of us individually and the Jewish experience. You know, people ask, why be Jewish? Why join this congregation? Well, my quick answer is that Judaism provides us a path to four things. The first is meaning. Some of you are my age. Do you remember a film where the, the it wasn't a great film, but the song was terrific. What's it all about? Alfie, right? Do you remember that? What's it all about? A, a sacred community should be a place where I figure that out. Where I figure it, what it, what's it all about this life we're living? That's a search for meaning and a congregation ought to provide that. The second thing is purpose. At a synagogue, I should be able to find the purpose, a purpose in my life. How, how can I bring my God-given talents and gifts to make the world a better place in our work in social justice, to bring healing to the world? How can we, uh, how can I volunteer, not just because someone's twisted my arm, but because I find purpose in volunteering in the community? The third thing is a sense of belonging, which I've already spoken about. And the fourth is a place to celebrate the many blessings in our lives. So meaning, purpose, belonging, and blessing. So I, I think we should always keep that front of mind as we strategically plan how we do this engagement work. Now you're all in on this. I mean, you, you're, all, you're doing it. You know, uh, most of you on this call are already regulars. You're already engaged in building this sacred community. But as a growing community, the next thing to talk about is how do we engage these new people? How do we strengthen the community and the relationships we already have? And how do we warmly welcome uh, new people 
and recruit new people in our growing community. Um, you know, I've, I've yet to meet a synagogue that doesn't think it's warm and welcoming. Everybody thinks it's a warm and welcoming congregation and yours probably is. But I have to tell you something. I mean, I, we've been friends for a little while now, right? 21 minutes. Uh, so let me be blunt because I love you. A lot of the regulars come to the synagogue and mostly hang out with each other and don't do enough work in welcoming the newcomer. I, I have a famous story about this. Um, I was once at, not, not far from you in Philadelphia at a suburban large congregation. And on Friday night, the rabbi emeritus said to me, Ron, tomorrow, you won't have to sit on the beam if you don't want, you can sit with me on the pulpit. I said, that's great. I'll look for you in the morning. So come Shabbat morning, this was a big conservative synagogue. The service was scheduled to start at nine o'clock. I'm there at 10 minutes before nine. There were about six other regulars who always come on time. And by, 10, by nine o'clock, there was another eight or so people who were members of the Bar Mitzvah family that morning. Uh, who had taken, and some guests, who had taken the invitation literally. They didn't know you could show up at uh, 1030. So I walk into this sanctuary that seated 700 people, and I take a seat on the second to the last row on the aisle, waiting for the Rabbi Meredith to come because he wasn't there at nine o'clock. So I'm sitting there and the davening, the praying begins and it's now about 9.15. And suddenly I feel a tap on my shoulder. And I look up and I see the sweetest gentleman and he looks at me with the saddest eyes. And he says to me the following, you know, I wouldn't tell you that you're sitting in my seat. And then he continues, you have to hear this exactly how it happened, he says. Then he points to an empty seat right behind me in the last row. And he says to me, I would sit in that seat, this in the last row. But if I sat there, where would my friend who always sits there sit? Now, I looked around the sanctuary and there were 675 empty seats. But this man needed that seat. Now, I knew that man. I didn't know him personally, but I knew the type. So I moved. I, I, I moved to a different seat. But then I thought to myself, if I were new to Rehoboth, if I were new uh, and were trying out a congregation, and this happened to me, off my list. I probably would have walked out. It's true that this man was worried, would be worried about his friend who wasn't in his regular seat because that's the essence of a relational community, right? He would worry about it. But then I thought, well, what could he have said to me that would have welcomed him, welcomed me, to the congregation and gotten him his seat. So I know you're all muted, but think, think for a minute with me. What's the very first thing this man should have said to me? Because it's the very first thing you should say when you see somebody you don't know in at Seaside. What's the very first thing he should have said to me? Maybe people could write it in the chat. Okay, write, in write the it chat in the what chat. You think, What's the first thing he should have said? Come on. I'm looking at the chat. Or Rabbi Julie, oh, Lynn's got it. Like, yeah, Shabbat Shalom. What's the second thing he could have said to me? Come on, write it in. Oh, my name is, that's good. What else could he have said to me? Are you a new member? Okay. Are you a guest? 
Very good. He could have said, would you like to sit with me? Now, I told this story to the congregation I belong to, Valley Beth Shalom in Encino, California. A guy named Murray Geller on the board raises his hand. He said, it happened to us. I said, what happened, Murray? He said, well, we're usually in the fifth row in the first seat. And one Shabbat, we were late. And there are two people sitting in our seats. So we said, Shabbat Shalom, may we sit with you? And sure enough, they were thrilled and they moved over two seats. So they got, <laughs> they got their seats. But then as the tour parade happened, they started a schmooze. And it turns out they were not there for the bar mitzvah. They were there because they had heard about Valley Beth Shalom and they just wanted to check it out. They were visiting from Toronto, Canada. So then in the second parade of the Torah scrolls that morning, the Gellers invited the Goldbergs from Toronto to sit with them at Kiddish lunch. And I told this story in Toronto, Canada, a few years later, in a group like this, leaders of congregations, and from the back of the room shoots up a hand and says, we're the Goldbergs. And we've been friends with the Gellers for 25 years. We've been to each other's kids' weddings. And it all happened because they knew what to say to a stranger. Welcome. Shabbat Shalom. May we sit with you. May we engage you. So the very first step that I need to recommend to you, as I know you think you're warm and welcoming, it's more than greeters. It's each of us is a representative, an ambassador of the congregation. And each of us needs to do what I learned at the Disney University. You know, there's such a thing, the Disney University, it's their quality service. It's how they train their cast members, their employees. And they opened it up a number of years ago and I got to go. And they say to their employees, do spend five minutes and do something special for one of our guests. So my plea to you is spend five minutes, especially when we're back in person, to say hi to someone you don't know and not to sell the congregation, but to hear their stories. We'll talk more about that in a second. Can I, I'm just going to interject one thing. We are, we are in person. Like all of our events oh, great. are almost on person. We have a few things only on Zoom, mostly in Wonderful. person and hybrid. Our services are hybrid. And so just okay, that's we mentioned that a couple of times, definitely Thank in person. You, Julie. By the way, Rabbi Julie, and by the way, we've got to work on your website. There needs to be more pictures of people. The first thing I see on your website is a lovely photo of your building. And congratulations. But that's not what I'm joining. I'm not joining a building. I'm joining a community of people doing great things. The only pictures I saw really on your website are the education web, web page with a bunch of pictures of the kids doing interesting things. That's great. And please, no pictures of empty sanctuaries. I don't want to go to an empty sanctuary. I, I want to see a full sanctuary if you have a picture of it. But you get my point? Let's put people up front. Now, here's the second step. We have to go beyond welcoming to engagement. And what does that mean? That means we have to learn about our people in a different way. You know how most synagogues learn about the new members? What do you think? They, what's the first thing you, a new member usually gets from a big synagogue? I'm sure it's not true at Seaside. What's the first thing they get? Put it in the chat. A survey? Yeah, yeah, maybe. What else do they get? A directory? Mm, yeah, maybe. A handbook? A bill. Thank you, Leslie. That's right. Pay your dues. That's the first thing. Then you get a survey. A survey of what? You get, you get a demographic form to fill out, right? A membership form. I've studied these all over the country, the demographic forms. They're usually the same thing. Name and your name in Hebrew, if you know your name in Hebrew. 
I have a cousin who thought her Hebrew name was Brontosaurus. For real. It, it was Brontosaurus, but she thought it was Brontosaurus. And then there's a list, yeah, your site list. And then often there's a list of committees to please, please, please volunteer for these committees. We need you. And nobody does. I mean, you, I know you all did, and that's great, but a lot of people don't. Why? Right? They're busy. And it's a, a demographic form doesn't do it. Another quick story. My, our daughter, Javi, uh, went to the University of Michigan. She comes back to Los Angeles for graduate school. And a girlfriend of hers says, you got to get on J-Date. Do you have J-Date there in Delaware? J-Date is the Jewish dating service. Javi doesn't want to do it, but finally she agrees to do it. She's like a kid in a candy store. She's going on six J-Dates a night mostly at Starbucks, close to Susie and me. So she'd come over and tell us about the dates. One night she comes home, she says, I met him, he's perfect on paper. I said, Javi, what it means, what does this mean? Perfect on paper. She said, he's tall, he's handsome. His JD profile, he's got his arm around his bubby, his grandma, goes to shul and wait for it, he's a dentist. He's a dentist, great, okay. And this guy fell for our daughter, a beautiful young woman, immediately. They were supposed to go for coffee. He said, no, nope, we're going to go have dinner. And in the J-Date world, this is known as an instant upgrade to that date. They start dating. It's three months. It's six months. It's a year. It's a year and a half they're dating. And we're thinking, OK, come on already. Meanwhile, my school, the American Jewish University, where I'm a professor, changes its dental plan. And I say to the dentist on a Friday night in our home, I need a new dentist. He says, come to me. I'm all over that. I go to him. He's very good. I come back to Susie. I say, honey, you got to go to the dentist. She looks at me with a for crimp to put him. Does anybody know Yiddish? A sour face. And she says, Ronnie, I can't go to him. I don't want nothing to, I don't want to, no, no, I can't do it. I said, Susie, listen. He could be our son-in-law. You must go to the dentist. I'll never forget what she said as she got into the car for her first appointment with the dentist. Good thing he's not a gynecologist. That's, that's good. And she comes back with a better story. I said, well, how did it go with the dentist? She says, well, you know, like you go to a doctor dentist the first time they give you a clipboard with a demographic form. I said, yeah. She said, so the first line on the form was name, and I wrote in Susie Wolfson. And the second line on this form was name I prefer to be called. She wrote in mom. Give me a break. Mom, I think it's the funniest thing I ever heard. It didn't work out, but... Uh, with the dentist, but uh, he wasn't the guy we thought he was, but she met a wonderful guy. They've been married almost 15 years. We have two beautiful grandchildren. One's name is Ellie Brooklyn. I have a granddaughter named Brooklyn. I called my partner in Synagogue 2000, Larry Hoffman at HUC in New York and said, Larry, I got our first grandchild. Her name is Ellie Brooklyn. And Larry doesn't miss a beat. He says, Ron, you're gonna have four more grandchildren. Manhattan, Staten, Queens, or you can call her Malka. And if you get a boy, you can call him the Bronx. We can do better than demographic forms. We need to hear our people, learn our people. Now there are various ways to do this and they're all outlined in the Relational Judaism Handbook. One way is to have one-on-one -on -one coffees or even one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls. And what's the purpose of that call or that coffee date? It's not to sell the synagogue, not to ask for volunteers, not to pitch a program. It's to hear the person's story. Tell me about you. What are your interests? What are your passions? 
What are your talents? And then when you do a listening campaign and you hear the stories of these people, they will feel seen and heard and you can begin to collect the stories that you all hear. If you all divided up new members and did this, you can then sort of connect people and say, oh, this person is really interesting, really interested in, in social justice. Well, let me connect you with this family or this person. You, you get what I'm talking about? But you can't do that from a demographic forum. You can do it only when you invest the time to do one-on-ones or some congregations do what are called house parties. Now that people are gathering together again, you can have 10 people in a living room and do the same thing. Let's share our stories with each other. Let's talk about how we found Seaside. And out of those conversations, you can make these connections. Uh, a synagogue in Westchester County in New York did this listening campaign. I know you have a bunch of seniors there on the beach. Uh, so in the listening campaign in Temple Israel Center in, um, in Westchester County, they, they learned from the seniors some things they couldn't believe because nobody really talked to the seniors. They had a problem, two problems. The first problem was they couldn't come to Shul, the synagogue, on Friday night. Why? You know why. They can't drive. They couldn't drive anymore. So I met a synagogue, I was at a synagogue in Boston where they solved that problem a number of years ago by giving out taxi vouchers, or today you'd give them an Uber thing, right? Not a nice idea. But Temple Israel Center decided, no, we're gonna get a group of volunteers to pick up the seniors who need a ride, which is a much better, uh, opportunity to build a relationship between the driver, the volunteer, and the senior. You know what the second problem they said was in their listening campaign, the seniors? They didn't like to come to the synagogue on Saturday morning anymore because they were getting trampled in the after shul on the push to the buffet table for the kiddish lunch. I, I asked a group of people like this. I said, okay, how would you solve that problem in your synagogue? Yeah, one guy raises his hand. He says, I would make, I'd have the rabbi make an announcement. Please let the seniors go first. I said, have you ever been on a plane when there are people in the back who want to make a quick connection? And the flight attendant says, please stay in your seats so people can make that connection and nobody ever does. Famished Jews are not going to stop and let the seniors go first. What do you think the solution was? Who, put, who could put in the chat a solution? Come on. What would you do for these seniors? Uh, anybody have an idea what you would do? Yes, have someone bring them plates. That's exactly right. They had a table set up and, and they got served. They didn't have to stand in line. But it takes some thinking about how to serve our people. Uh, so listen to your people. You know, the watchword of Judaism is not Daber Yisrael, talk people of Israel. It's Shema Yisrael, listen people of Israel. So we got to do a lot more listening to our people in order to build relationships. Here's a third thing that we can do. And you're already doing it. Rabbi Julie said it already. You build small groups. Now, for example, I want to join your bowling league. I, I, I want to go to Millsboro Lanes on Thursday and bowl. My high score was 265. Is that good? Okay, so I, I volunteer for the bowling group. And I know you have other groups and we need many more groups. My goal for you would be to look at your membership roster of your 600 people and say, 
are we connecting these folks with each other in any way at all? And especially in a small group that could be organized around four ways. The first is affinity, what people like to do together, or what they're interested in. Second is demography, their stage of life. Third is geography, where do they live? During COVID, as people got together in neighborhoods, we saw that. I know a synagogue that deployed shofar blowers to different neighborhoods on Rosh Hashanah. People were coming to the synagogue, but they wanted people to hear the sound of the shofar. That's by geography. And availability, when can we get people to join? And then one more point, and then we'll open it up for conversation. We have to do a much better job of keeping in personal touch with our people, not robocalls, not voicemail on the synagogue answering machine, but ways that we can personally reach out. And I'm sure you do a lot of this. I can tell you my best story about this is my wife, Susie, um, had a kidney transplant at the famous Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, three weeks before COVID hit. So we got stuck in Rochester, Minnesota for almost eight months. We couldn't get back to Los Angeles because she's immunocompromised. She's doing very well now, thank God. By the way, I donated my spare kidney on her behalf. It's called a paired kidney exchange. My kidney went to a woman I didn't know in Florida, Jacksonville, Florida. And as soon as she got my kidney, she was still in the hospital. She obviously Googled me and sent me an email of gratitude that said, dear Dr. Wolfson, I'm so blessed to have received your kidney. I had a 3% chance of getting a match. You've saved my life. And I want you to know you're a Jewish educator. I'm a Christian educator. I teach in our Sunday school. My husband is the pastor of our church. A friend of your friend, Rick Warren. She had seen a picture of us, Rick Warren and Ron Wolfson. And then she wrote the sweetest thing. She said, I've named your kidney in my body Solomon because you write books of Jewish wisdom. And then the best of all, she said, she finished her email saying, I feel so blessed to have received a Jewish kidney. Come on. You know, in those eight months, we got 27,000 messages on CaringBridge. Do you know that's, that's a platform you can talk about, you know, what's going on in your healing process? We had dozens of gifts, all kinds of phone calls. You know what stayed on our bed stand at the Hilton Hotel for almost eight months? Handwritten cards. People took the time to find a get well card and write a, a personal message to us. That's what stayed on our bed stand. Uh, one year on my birthday, I got a, a card in the mail from Chase Bank. And I opened it up and on Chase Stationery, it said, Dear Mr. Wolfson, happy birthday. Uh, when you were in the bank last week, you mentioned that your grandchildren were coming to celebrate with you. How was their visit? Next time they're in Los Angeles, please bring them by the branch so we might meet them. Have a wonderful day. Sincerely, Valerie, your Chase Bank teller. That's how she signed it. I've never gotten a card like that from a synagogue. So if I get a, bit, a warmer card from Chase Bank, than I do for my synagogue, we have work to do. I know a synagogue here in Los Angeles called Ikar. It has the most unusual Yiskor book, you know, the memorial service for, for, the, for particularly on Yom Kippur. It's not just a list of names of people who are being remembered by so-and-so. They invited the congregants to write little stories about the people they're remembering. And so there's a 
self-published book of these beautiful stories about people they're remembering. And people are reading this during Yisker. It just brings tears to my eyes. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And connection comes before commitment. And those are the watchwords of a relational Judaism. So Rabbi, why don't we open up for anybody to ask a question or a comment? We can have a little dialogue. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll give a few little hearts here. <laughs> Thank you. And if you'd like to um, have a, if you have a question, I'm sure there are a lot, you know, and um, specific to our community and which hopefully in some ways isn't like some of those communities <laughs> of old, but we still face some of the same challenges. So if people would like to, please, can you uh, raise your hand, preferably raise your hand using the reaction at the bottom of your screen, and then you can use the raise hand will make it a little easier for me to identify people that have a question. Okay, or some, yeah. Questions, questions. If I, I'm gonna start with a question, since right. I don't I don't know why everyone's so shy, but I do have a don't question. Don't be shy. Okay, my question is, what is, yeah, because <laughs> question is how much of this, all these writing, I actually spoke to one of my mentors, Rabbi Sam Stahl, you may know who he is, is a prominent reform rabbi at a big synagogue. And he was talking about the handwritten notes and stuff, or I don't know, or now or printed notes that he signed. Of course, his secretary, you know, addressed them or whatever. But the question is, who's writing all these notes? Who's calling all these people? Who's taking them all to coffee? Because there's just one me and hundreds of people. So how did the members, member leaders get involved in doing this? Yeah. How do you organize? You know, it's great ideas, but how do you organize all these things? The yeah. synagogues that have done this well have created a team of people, volunteers, lay people, yeah. uh, to do this work. So you take a membership list and you see our 10 to 15, maybe in your community, 30%, maybe 50% of your members are already engaged. They already have a group of friends. They come to events, whether in person or online. Now in person, it's great. Uh, but what about the people we don't know well? So if you just started with those folks, if you just started with the new member, the newer members, yeah. uh, it would be fantastic. And, you know, like when you do fundraising campaigns, it's not calling cards or, you know, making phone calls to raise money. It's making calls to hear people's stories. And you promote this in the congregation. You let people know this is happening. Uh, I know a synagogue that put in their bulletin, you know, kind of updates on their relational engagement campaign. And it could be a team of, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 people who would volunteer to do this. Some people like to do it, some people don't. If, you, you know, if you're not kind of outgoing, you wouldn't do it. But if you are, you're gonna learn a ton about these folks and you can then collect the data and make connections. It should not be on your uh, shoulders, Rabbi. Uh, you've got other things. I do my things best, I do my best. <laughs> you're doing, you, I'm sure you do a great job. And so we, Thank you. So I, I'm I'm taking notes here. You know, everyone knows I'm a note taker. So the and the book. We've got the book. Our, our board members have all gotten copies and read Wonderful. it. But um, so we have some people that have raised hands, and we have some people that have um, written things in the chat. So let's go to this raised hand from Alan and Leslie Slan. I can I see there's some more things coming up in the chat. We'll get to those too. Yeah. Hi. First of all. Uh, Dr. Ruth Wolfson, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, I had seen you many years ago. Um, I was uh, active in the uh, Jewish network of NACI, and you yes. came and spoke to our group, and um, I, I still right. remember you. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I was just saying, when you were talking, Rabbi Julie, we, we have a HESED committee, and that could be something that the HESED committee could do. Um, but we also put, put, put out every month the birthdays, and I know um, I've done, you know, sent birthday cards to people. Um, we could have people, you know, just write, you know, we can 
get a, a bunch at the, at the uh, Dollar Tree and get cards and just write personal messages to them um, on their birthday. And I think that would go a long way too. Sure. There, there are other things we, that's wonderful. It's great, great that we remember this uh, meeting together. Um, have you ever gotten an email from a friend who says, check this out and there's a link to an article in a paper or uh, or a book that you'd be interested in. So again, if we do these conversations with our people and we know what their interests are and they get an email from somebody that says, check this out. You know, it, it, what, it, what, it's, what does it say? It says, we know you <laughs> and we remember you and we wanna connect with you. And we, we think you'll be interested in this. And it's, it's, it's just a way of expressing your interest in being in relationship with the person. It's what we do for our friends and our family. <laughs> so we just need to do it more broadly in the congregation. How does this work with hybrid, someone asks? That's Gabriel? Yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, the congregations that had adopted many of these strategies before the pandemic hit did better during the pandemic than the places that were back in the transactional programmatic model. Why did they do better? Because it was bad times for everybody. And the people that were already connected to a small group, the small groups morphed from in-person to online. Uh, as soon as people learned the technology of Zoom, uh, we could do one-on-ones, we could do small group meetings. I know synagogues now that are continuing to do their business online here in Los Angeles because the traffic is so bad. <laughs> yeah, real, For real. They're having committee meetings and team meetings and, and even executive committee meetings on the hybrid, hybrid uh, because of, I mean, I'm sure traffic is not a problem in Seaside, but. Uh, oh, we're laughing. Well, well it depends. In the, summer season. Okay. in the summer season, there's a lot. Right now, November, it's breezy. Okay. <laughs> but it's not so, Los Angeles. Um, yeah, people scared me. It's not quite Los Angeles. Um, but, yeah, but, we have. But you, you've, we've got to use both, is my point. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You can use, you can connect over Zoom. That's fine. Right. And then Cheryl asked about Havurot. Um, it's a good question. That, yeah. Kavarot are fabulous when the social chemistry worked. I, I mean, I belong to a synagogue that started Synagogue Kavarot, uh, Valley Bas Shalom. They're Kavarot that have been in business together for, they've been together for 50 years. But if the social chemistry did not work, they fell apart. That's the difference between a Kavura and a small group. In a small group, they're on ramps and off ramps. They're usually time limited. So we're not asking for a lifetime commitment as you, you felt in a Chavara. You're saying, you know what? This, this book group is gonna meet for three months. This, uh, this Purim spiel group is gonna meet for six weeks before we do the Purim spiel. You know, it, there's an on-ramp and an off-ramp. And you can go from group to group. Yeah. It, but the point is that there are lots of ways to engage, and it's not a life sentence. That's the other reason people won't volunteer for a committee. If you volunteer for a committee in most synagogues, it's a life sentence. You'll never get off. And you'll be made the chair automatically, you know, in most congregations. We got to do better than that. Have I ever been to Lewis, Delaware? Lewis, Lewis, that's where we're Lewis, from. Delaware. Oh, that's what we do. We connect with new people. Fabulous. <laughs> well, actually, that's a good question about the, a little more of that about the committees, because that is um, an issue that comes up that people sign up for committees, but don't really participate. So are you suggesting that if there was a short-term request, that might be easier for people than saying, would you join this committee? open-ended for a... <laughs> yeah. I think uh, when you ask somebody to volunteer for a short-term commitment and it's successful, they, they do some work 
for the congregation and they feel good about it, mm -hmm. you can then come back to them and, and get deeply, more deeply involved in the life of the congregation. I, I, I think that's absolutely a, a great strategy. Okay, so looks like David Herschler. Yeah, Dave, David Herschler has his hand raised, and then Anita has her Smolian has her hand. Okay, raised. good. Yeah, so so on, on this point about um, uh, asking people to volunteer, uh, I think it's more effective if you uh, establish your relationship with uh, with people with an individual first before you ask them to volunteer. Uh, among other things. You learn a little bit about um, uh, whether or not this person might actually uh, want to to be part of that committee, whether they uh, uh, would be good for that committee, or maybe do something different and suggest that they yeah. do something different. Absolutely, yes. And there's also the the I'll add one point uh, to that, David. Uh, tapping on the shoulder of your friends is a good strategy. We, we don't do enough tapping on the shoulder. You know, I could really use your help doing X, Y, and Z. My mom, God bless her soul, was raising three boys. She was running her own business in the 1950s. Something got in her head about the blind kids in Nebraska. And she asked our rabbi if she could uh, create a braille group. And she tapped the shoulders of several of her girlfriends. And they created the first braille group in a congregation that I know of back in the 50s, they raised the money to buy those. Remember before computers, they would do, uh, it was like a typewriter thing to do braille. They taught themselves how to do braille. These women in this small group in a closet in the synagogue created the first Hebrew English Passover Haggadah for the Jewish blind. And then my mother went on to chair a, a, a group that supported Jewish uh, blind kids in Nebraska, not Jewish blind kids. Uh, for 50 years, my mom did that. Because it, it was, I don't know even why she did it, but it, it, it became her passion. So the, the point is, find out the passions of your people and say, hey, in our community here at Seaside, you can, you can do this work with us. Then, yeah, Anita. Thank you. Anita, yeah, unmute. <laughs> Got to unmute. I think a perfect example of this is a out uh, as a growth out of our fundraising committee. I started as a soup club. Once a month, we would sell soup. God, I love that. I put an ad in the paper, and I attracted every initial member of that soup club was not an active member of Seaside some of whom, and I am active, I didn't know. And this group bonded and we worked together to make soup. We had arguments, what kind of soup? But the point is we got these people together, right. we brought them in this way, and some of them are infiltrating other committees, other projects in Seaside. I, I so it can be done, it yes. really can be done. I'll give you another great example, that's beautiful. I'll give you another great example. I was in a synagogue in Marin County, California, near San Francisco, uh, where on Thursday night they had a challah baking group. And a bunch of people came in, young, old, male, female, there, the whole group, a whole bunch of people come and bake, bake challah. I was there as a scholar residence on Friday night. So there's a, a, a proneg. Do you know what a proneg is? That's the before services. There was wine and cheese, a, a, a pronet, a, a snack and yak. I don't know, there, a lot of, lots of names for these things. Comes time to go into the sanctuary for Kabbalat Shabbat service. And I'm walking through this, the, the foyer of the building and there's a long table with halot, challah breads in plastic with a uh, Google map on them. And I said to the rabbi, what's that? And she said, oh, well, we have the hollow baking group on Thursday night. And if people can't come to the synagogue for whatever reason, uh, volunteers who are there Friday night, see if the, if the person asking is in the neighborhood they live in, and could they drop off the hollow? 
So people are picking up these kalot and delivering them after services. I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> Just absolutely beautiful. Thank, well, uh, there's been a lot of interest. To, thank you so much. And I know people are making some observations in the chat. I'm going to save this chat so that we'll make sure to, you know, take in comments that were made and observations and we, and if appropriate, reach out. And also, yeah, please reach out to also to me or reach out to our president, Joel Simon. I just brought, uh, so Dr. Wolfson, we can ask you like one, I guess you may have way you want to wrap up, but I wanted to ask you like, what next? What do you think our next step should be as we want to grow what we already do in relational Judaism? We want to make it, you know, grow yeah. and flourish. Well, first, first of all, a shout out to my dear friend, Sarah Simon, who I've known forever. Hi, Sarah. Great to see you. And yes, of course, I know Glenn Easton. He's a terrific guy. And um, yeah, the next step is to, uh, I would gather a group of your most dedicated people interested in this project, a relational engagement campaign. I would read that handbook which has many, many strategies for doing this. And I would develop a, a plan to start slow, to, to do a few things that will be successful. And, and then you're off and running. My wrap up is this. Number one, go Phillies. Number two, Let's go back to Hini Matova Manayim. And Rabbi Julie brilliantly taught you this on Rosh Hashanah. Let me just underline it. Hine Matova Manayim, look how good and pleasing it is. Shevet Achim, when all of us uh, are living, dwelling in sacred community, Gam Yachad, also together. It doesn't make sense. The word Gam means also. The psalm could easily have said, why is this word gam there? Well, to remind you of Rabbi Julie's teaching, the gam is there according to the book of the Zohar to indicate when we are in relationship with each other, it's not only pleasing to us, it's pleasing to God. Whatever, however you define God. For me, God is right here. When I shake your, can I shake your hand? Can everybody shake hands with Ron? There you go. Can I give you a hug? I'll give you a hug. If I were in person, that's what I'd be doing. Because for me, God is in the between. Each of us is made but Salam Elohim in the image of God. If we create a seaside spiritual community where each of us is seen and heard as the image of God we are made to be, that's where I find divinity. That's where I find sacred community. So God bless you. And let's sing on the way out. And I'm going to hang around in the, pro the after neg. <laughs> so if you want to schmooze, I'm around for another 10 minutes or so. Everybody, <laughs> join me in. A little louder, I can't hear you. Love you all. Happy New Year. Happy Thanksgiving. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'll stop the recording, but if people want to hang out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.